This video is going to be a behind the scenes of how I modified gouge and splatting to work on Mac. It's also going to lead us in the creation of a universal gouge and splatting tool that we can use on both Mac and PC. The original gouge and splatting plugin from Tim Gerritsen had some errors in terms of how color was translated when we used it on Mac. Now, I made a couple of alterations to the GLSL component, and these generally worked pretty well. But what I have found is I was previously using mostly scans from Luma AI. These worked great with the Luma AI scans, but less good with Scanniverse. So let's load in some Scanniverse images here, and let's just see what the difference is. Let's go find something in my messy folder here. We can see that the color representation isn't quite accurate. I'm going to load the same file in here. And we can see that this updated version is much better. What I'm going to do is go into the original Tim Gerritsen and show you how I have modified this to make this work. And this is a universal fix for both Mac and PC. I'm also going to show you some methods for making augmented point cloud systems out of these tools. Okay, so we're going to start with that raw component. When we load the original tox, we see something that looks like this. This is the default object that's loaded in within it. What we need to do to make this actually output something that we can see in terms of the full color spectrum is go inside this Gaussian splat component and make modifications there. What I'm going to do is split my screen and view this as a panel so we can actually see what the output is as we are making these edits. I'm going to go inside. Inside the Gaussian splat component, we have a few areas here. So we have things calculating the camera focal, the Gaussian splat source. So this is going to be most of what we're familiar with in terms of translating the XYZ positions of point clouds. And this is going into something that's going to calculate the colors of each of those points as well. We also have this section that is a sorting section that's created from the Bitonic sort by David Braun and elements that identify scale and rotation of those splats. Because obviously, when we actually zoom in, we're seeing that these things are kind of these positioned donuts in, in space. So each splat is a kind of a different shard length. We really just have to go into this calculate color section. This is where we are having these issues. So if I double click to go inside or press the I key to go inside the calculate colors component, we're going to see pretty quickly what the error is. So if I go to the GLSL compute and click on this little warning sign, we can basically see that we have too many input textures for this GPU. I think the limit on at least this Mac that I'm on now, which is an M1, is 16 input textures. We can see that we have slightly more than that. Let's go with the flow here and just start deleting some inputs and see what happens. I'll start off just deleting that input 15, which is our 16th input. So we can see deleting that, we get something that now somewhat resembles the scene, although it is in a sort of horrible sepia. But we're starting to get something that now resembles the scene a little bit more. We can at least see some color and images in that scene. What I'm going to do now is going to go into this GLSL code and we're going to take a look at what that does. So the section that we're kind of going to look at is this area that is calculating our spherical harmonics. So this whole section here. And what we can see here is we have a whole bunch of code that's relating to all of these other inputs and going to take those harmonics and actually do something with them. But we also have this VEC3 color, which is the main component that's going to feed our color through. And it's looking at this first index of its inputs. And this is what we actually want to make sure we're getting to have an accurate shade and we don't need all these extra inputs. So let's try deleting all this stuff and see what happens. Okay, so once we've deleted that, 
we're not going to get such a detailed simulation, but we do have the original color because we are just sampling the RGB. We're not sampling any of the extra stuff that was being potentially calculated weirdly on our different setup. Now, what's super cool about this is we can change the index of the input and see different inputs of how this is arranged in space. So let's try our zero index. And here we can actually see a sort of a heat map of how things are arranged in space, essentially kind of like a normals in 3D, which is super cool. We can also go to this index two and I'll zoom out a little bit and we can see this sort of more grayscale sort of metallic image of this. So we obviously have a few options, but for us and for our needs, we just want that first input which is going to take the RGB and allow us to see that through. So this is really all of the changes that we have to make, which is just going in and removing this section of code. So we have access just to that original RGB input that we're finding in color. And this should do the trick. I wanted to take a quick moment just to cross-reference what removing that section of the GLSL code actually does. And I kind of chatted about it, but basically it's taking away some of those higher order spherical harmonic terms. And ChatGPT kind of describes what removing those does. So obviously in the case of just keeping this section of VEC3 color and getting that texel, we're able to keep the original color, but we're losing things like directional lighting and some of this subtle spatial variation. But overall, what I have found is that the simulations that I have been achieving on my PC versus my Mac haven't really varied too much in quality by removing this stuff. So for my uses, getting the spatial positioning, the length and rotation of those splats, plus the original color is good enough for me. Obviously, this is just something to bear in mind that there are obviously some drawbacks to this system of removing some of this code. You're going to have something that's less realistic and ambient in appearance. But overall, it's uh, something that makes this more usable on my computer. And this is something I choose to go with so I can continue to work remotely using my laptop versus a PC workstation. If I go up a layer, I can make changes to the layout of this scene, much like we would do with a traditional point cloud. So if we want to make these point cloud manipulations, and I'm going to show you where we would make these changes. So we want to make changes going into this section, into this point transform. And simply starting, we can just input a noise. And we're going to see that we're making these alterations based on that noise. So if I switch the monochrome off and update the noise, we can see that we are making these sort of explosions in our scene. Likewise, if we do a simple feedback loop by inserting some feedback, noise, add to the second input, on the output, we're going to change the RGB to just noise. We're going to add an add. And sometimes it's best to do this when your project is paused, so we don't get this kind of death of frame rate. Once we reset that feedback loop, it will be absolutely fine and update properly. But what we're going to do is add in this noise. We're going to bring down that offset and that amplitude to like 0.04. We're going to add together the noise and the feedback. And then we'll have a null, which will drag onto our feedback. Oops. And basically what's happening here is every frame, we're going to add some kind of displacement to that, to that original feedback. So let's bring that in. Let's switch that so it is on monochrome or monochrome off. And so now we get this scene where things are moving around. We're going to add in a keyboard reset. Hold 
doubles that. And now we have a scene where the noise is moving around. And obviously this is something where you can basically update whatever your specific effect is that you want to use in this section here. In terms of optimization, turning down that splat size a little bit is going to improve your frame rate, likewise moving that alpha threshold. But this is a really good time for me to introduce a sort of a new element that I have built to ensure that we can do these 3D operations but only working with a section of the point cloud itself by essentially cropping it. And this was something I found kind of hard to do initially. I have made a version of this Gaussian Splat plugin, which I have shared previously, that allows us to do essentially thresholding. So we can have a Gaussian splat, which we can see sort of loaded here. And I have a horizon threshold here. So I can basically drag this horizon threshold and let's load something that's maybe a little bit bigger. Let's grab that. Okay. I'm gonna load that in. And so this is a much bigger point cloud. If I zoom out, we're gonna see as I kind of move through that we have a lot of stuff here. Zooming out more, those edges are getting kind of chunky. And basically what I can do with this horizon threshold and in a previous plugin um, that I'll share in the links, I had created this limiting factor that essentially cropped things in a, in a box, but we had all these edge elements kind of be pushed in. So everything was still being visualized. This new horizon thresholding component allows me to actually take out those particles so I can actually go to have just the section that I might want to manipulate, which in this case is this image of me zooming around. You can obviously move things like that. I can change down that splat size. I can play with the alpha threshold, but we have something that is gonna be a lot less intensive now because we're just rendering less particles and putting less particles through. The operation here would be exactly the same. After this GLSL, which is what I'm processing this um, cropping with, we could go in and add our noise. However, we see fit to make sort of these operations. go in and add sort of much fancier models and things like that. So if I go and just do my feedback, my noise, and my add, we can see that my frame rate is not tanking nearly as much as it was before. Do that just as noise. Add these together and I'm going to drag that back onto the feedback. And now we can see that if I amp that noise up a little bit, let me change the period, we get that sort of effect. But again, it's just affecting that smaller thresholded area. And if I go out, I can apply it to more of my space. There we go. And now we can dissolve that scene. So this is a super useful tool to have on hand. And this is going to be available as an updated Gaussian Splat tool in my Patreon. I've also updated my free version of the Gaussian Splat tool as something that is now universally gonna work on both Mac and PC. Stay tuned for more tutorials and more development as I continue to play with Gaussian splats. Um, I'll show you some ways that you can add in things like attractors in the next video.